Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants to this second webinar, Environmental Peace Building in Colombia, Rule of Law and the Limits of the Rights of Nature in Post-Conflict Colombia. We are glad to be able to reach a continental and transoceanic audience. Wang Zhanghao, Woman Chai Zhongguo de Peng Yuoman, Sai Kun Shan Du Ka Da Shui, Da Peng Yuoman, Wang Zhanghao, Wang Zhanghao, Wang Jing. Buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches a todos los participantes de este segundo seminario virtual sobre construcción de paz y medio ambiente en Colombia, el Estado de Derecho y los límites de los derechos de la naturaleza en la Colombia del posconflicto. Nos complace poder organizar un evento de tipo continental, además de transoceánico. In a time of great stiff, we meet again to learn about the important advances and shortcomings with regards to environmental policy during the post-conflict scenario in Colombia. In a moment of great preocupation, this moment of great concern, we learn again to uh, implement the agreements for post-conflict in Colombia in relation to the environmental agenda. University Center for International and Global Studies, and on behalf of the Environmental Peace Building Association, the Global Green Growth Institute, GGGI, Colombia, the Environmental Law Institute, and the International Masters in Environmental Policy at Duke Kunshan University in China. I welcome you all. Mi nombre es Miguel Rojas Sotelo. Represento al Centro de Estudios Internacionales de la Universidad. My name is Miguel Rojas Sotelo. I represent the Duke Center for International Global Studies and also in the Environmental Peace Building Association, the Global, Global Green Growth Institute, the, and also the Environmental Law Institute and the International Masters in Environment Policy at Duke Kanshan University. I welcome you all. Some logistical considerations. For those of you in need of a Spanish or Chinese to English and English to Spanish translation, please click here, the little icon that has a globe and says interpretation to tune into our simultaneous translation feed. Yingu fan yi xin diang ji xie li xie li para los que requieran de traducción del español. For those of you in need of Spanish to English and English to Spanish translation, please click here in this uh, icon to tune our simultaneous translation feed. Thanks for tuning to this series. Now, it is my great honor to introduce our presenters. Gloria Amparo Rodriguez, Professor of Law, Director of the Public Environmental Law Research Group at Universidad del Rosario in Bogota, Colombia, a senior fellow at the International Institute for the Sociology of Law and adjunct judge of the Constitutional Court of Colombia. Professor Rodriguez won the 2019 award Building Peace and Environment in Practice by the Environmental Peace Association for her legal and academic work in favor of nature and ethnic groups in Colombia. Her talk is titled, Territorial Rights and Peace Building, a Perspective from Colombian Jurisprudence. Los Derechos Territoriales en la Construcción de Paz Vistos desde la Jurisprudencia Colombiana. Our second speaker, Ivan Vargas Roncancio. Ivan is a lawyer with master's degrees in bio, science and law from National University of Colombia and Latin American studies from Duke University. Vargas is a PhD candidate in natural resources science at McGill University. He has worked for the Center for Public Policy Research at the University of California, Davis, 
and the Everyday Peace Indicators Project at George Mason University. Ivan's research follows indigenous practitioners, scientists, legal scholars across territories, labs, and courts of justice in an effort to contribute to a larger paradigm shift from redu reductionist environmental law and governance models to ecological systems based and other than human jurisprudence in post-conflict Colombia. The title of his talk is The Forest Goes to a Court of Law, Rights of Nature, Indigenous Legal Traditions and Comparison, Colombian Amazon. El Bosque Va a la Corte, Derechos de la Naturaleza, Tradiciones Legales Indígenas Comparadas en la Amazonía Colombiana. You will be able to find uh, 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 this text in the upcoming uh, Kristen Archer and Geoffrey Gerber edited volume from Environmental to Ecological Law that is in press now with Rutledge in 2021. And Jonas Evanson, Professor Evanson is a professor of environmental law, the former dean of the Faculty of Law and director of Stockholm Environmental Law and Policy Center at Stockholm University. He is the chair of the Compliance Committee of the UNECE Convention on Access to Information, Public Participation in Decision Making and Access to Justice in Environmental Matters the Aras Convention, and a member of the Swedish Academy of Letters, History and Antiquities. His talk is titled, Access to Justice, Learning from the Aras Convention Experience when Implementing the Escazú Agreement, Acceso a la Justicia, Aprendiendo de la Experiencia de la Convención de Aras al Implementar el Acuerdo de Escazú. Without any other remarks, I leave you with Professor Gloria Amparo Rodriguez. I would like to welcome everyone from Colombia. Colombia, a country that goes to, to, to better conditions, to building a Colombia that lives in harmony, that lives in peace, so that these and next generations can have better elements. We have gone through many years of a conflict that has generated a lot of deaths, that has caused very complex situations for women to peace building. It's a very difficult road that is gonna be long, that will have a lot of obstacles, challenges that not only be assumed by Colombians, but the whole humanity. We need Colombia in peace. And right now we are building for, we're working for them. So I would like to thank the invitation that you make to talk about territorial rights in Colombia and building peace how territorial rights are working in our country. So I would like to thank for the invitation that you make so that I can tell you what is happening in Colombia. We find judges through their jurisprudence, through their decisions, they're advancing to new theoretical frameworks in terms of peace building, in terms of territorial rights building. So. I am going to share my presentation with you. The presentation, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, so I will talk to you about territorial rights in peace building seen from Colombian jurisprudence. What have judges done to guarantee territorial rights? So they have been vulnerable. They have been in risk because of consequence of the armed conflict. Many of the communities where there is wealth in our country have had to suffer the consequences of conflict. In that sense, the Constitutional Court gives us key elements. Other judges give us key elements to address this topic. 
I will point out that the territory, as it is conceived, has multiple definitions. I would like to present to you a definition that we have worked with from our, uh, in, in the research group. That territory where people inhabit, where they have their everyday life, it is a place that is so important, so relevant for peoples and communities. Why? Because in that place, that's where they, where they have their live, where they have their life, where they have culture, they have economic activity, and they have their own ways of development. Because we cannot talk about just one way of development. There are multiple ways of development that communities have. And that there, in that place, is where they exist. So that's why it is so important to have the right to territorial and, and territorial guarantees so that uh, social tissue is strengthened, uh, livelihoods, all of this is strengthened to be able to develop. Territory is the key element. And I remember in that sense, somebody told me, Gloria Amparo, an indigenous person without land is like a bird without nest, a bird without a nest. So that you see the important connotation to rights to territories for these groups of people. In that sense, the Constitutional Court in Colombia has provided very important rulings and they have mentioned what territories, the definition, its importance. And territory is even framed with all those cultural connotations that peoples have surrounding them. We have here this indigenous person collecting clams, those clams that are right next to the beach. In this area where there used to be a mining port, he went there to, to, to conduct his cultural activity. That cultural activity is called the paramento. So, this is the nature. Why? This is a very important conf in environmental conflict in Colombia. So the the whole uh, areas that are inhabited by, by them is not only the places that have been exploited, but those environments where they have their traditional economic cultural activities. They don't inhabit there, but they have a very important cultural vision there surrounding them. For this community, that territory where there was a port that was built, that's a territory where they require this important element to be able to reproduce their culture. In that sense, we see how important territory it is for them. Well, having said this, territorial right in Colombia means acknowledging, acknowledging of the multi-ethnical and pluricultural nature that we have, acknowledging of these people that have the right to decide inside their territories. And for them is that they are acknowledged because they're going to be able to produce to reproduce culture. They're going to be able to have those traditions that they have and those ceremonies that they have, those relationship with the environment that is so different from the one that we have in this context. So that's why it is so important to keep in mind territorial rights. The Constitutional Court has pointed those important elements that need to be kept in mind in territory. The first one is they need to have that is called the resguardos. Resguardos is the property they have to live in those places. It's called resguardos. It is property ownership where they can reproduce their culture, but they will have safety that nobody will interfere with the way of life. Besides that, it, the right to territory is to have sacred areas from cultural, from their cosmovision, those special places where they have the ritual, cultural activities, where they have those sacred elements, like those sacred plants that they use for medicine or those sacred plants that they use for the rituals. It is also the possibility 
to for them to manage their territories right because they need to participate they need to have conditions to be able to use exploit and conserve natural resources and nobody has done it better than these communities because these communities for a long time have protected their territories their resources to the point that those areas with the greatest importance are in the territories of these people so this is related to protection of ecological importance for the country ancestrally traditionally they have inhabited there in point six the right to territory invites to exert self-determination self-governance for those communities so that they can live according to their customs to the government according to the way they educate the transmission level of knowledge oral tradition those are key elements to be kept in mind for these people so these peoples so i would like to tell you that colombian jurisprudence has given us all those elemental key elements to guarantee rights of these communities having said this what does what does right to territory imply what does it imply without a territory everything fades fades i'm sorry it loses strength there is nowhere to express culture quotes this is in quote an indigenous person told me this that is the importance it has for them we cannot live without a territory when we have when we have been displaced from our regions so that for that reason that exercise the right to territory implies that those communities can access to those places to their resources that they can conduct all those activities that have characterized them that they can possess that they can develop that they can control and use their lands their territories according to their cultures in that sense a right to ter to territory implies all those elements this image that you see here those are the judges high judges in our country going there to territories to talk to communities that's why judges work is so important in this matter we have magistrates of the constitutional court in colombia the highest body in our country to protect our constitution talking to indigenous peoples in their territory about their problems in that sense the constitutional court in several opportunities has gone directly to establish what conflicts are to be able to solve cases that's why from this approach with, which is an approach that we can have a dialogical justice so that judges can talk to all stakeholders and be able to make determinations. That's why we have importance to territory is seen by judges there in the field firsthand because they have been able to the constitutional court they have been able to establish ethnic groups in our country have a very important relationship where with their territories not only because there is the, the way they their livelihood because they guarantee uh food safety to live there to have their households but also because it is a comprehensive element of their cosmovision and religion that's why we need to value this work that judges do that they go to territories and of course in, within this context ethnical groups in peace building have a lot to do they this those way does the way of justice they practice justice in that sense we can see how ethnic groups build peace and they play an important role in the environment going back to rebuild a country that has been affected not only in health life of people but also in land in territory the territory has been affected by the conflict and in that sense it is key 
to see the role that they have in peace building, environmental organization, all those visions they have because of their practice and traditional knowledge. It is important to keep in mind that the state needs to recognize and support those cultural identities, communities' interests, so that they can they can have an active participation in decisions that need to be adopted. Here we have key elements like the right to participation and prior consultation that these peoples have in this area. The peace agreement, peace accord, we, you know we are going through complying to this over 60 years, more than 8 million victims in Colombia. Today, we have this agreement with FARC that was signed in 2016, and we are going to building that Colombia in peace that we all know it has a fundamental uh, axis, which is victims. Victims live in territory. That's why building stable and long-lasting peace must have victims as the main axis. Those historically vulnerable populations that are in Colombian territories. That's why this scenario, the post-conflict, is constitutes an important element to keep in mind territorial rights. In that context, I would like to point out something very important, that inside the a special jurisdiction uh, for peace, inside the peace accord, there is this territorial approach. This territorial approach and environmental approach of the peace accord proposes acknowledging needs and characteristics of those communities I have mentioned those characteristics that are related to economic, cultural, social activities related to territory. There is this intrinsic relationship between communities, territory, and the way they, uh, they have all these cultural, economic, and social activities. So what is the objective? To guarantee environmental sustainability in the country, and of course, everything that is related to implementing different, uh, so that different stakeholders are implemented, right? They are included. There needs to be this joint construction. So that's why we're talking about sanctions that are related to these topics that are so important, like the ones we have just mentioned. It is the first time that we have the peace accord that we have ethnic groups participation and this ethnic commission within the GEP, the just justice. We have the system for truth, justice, reparation and non-repetition, those judges that belong to ethnic groups. That's why we have this ethnic commission. This is uh, this permanent instance that promotes the approach within the jurisdiction. Here, it is important because they play a key role to be able to understand the relationship between the conflict, the post-conflict, and those tasks we need to conduct with those groups and with those visions. This is so important to highlight it among in, in our country. To the point that in those cases that we have right now, this peace special jurisdiction has a, had several rulings. The territory has been, for example, uh, considered as a victim of the armed conflict. We have important cases that involve African descendant organizations. It involves indigenous peoples. And in that sense, I need to highlight the inclusion, not only of territory as a victim, but also to keep in mind within the jurisdiction, the relationship of those communities with the territory. This is a key element for all decisions that are being made in Colombia surrounding this uh, topic. It is also mentioned, important to mention that our jurisprudence in our country, we are talking 
from the jurisprudence order. Another element I'm talking about, keeping in mind acknowledgement of territory as the subject of rights, a subject of rights. It's not only the GJEP, no, it's, it's, it's also the Constitutional Court, the Supreme Court of Justice, and many that are talking uh, uh, they are talking about nature rights. So this implies a very important challenge. It is a challenge for the 21st century for us to talk about subjects that talk, that have rights. Uh, I mean, subjects non-human that have right rights. It is a change of paradigm. It is a framework through which we can see the importance for judges to have this interdisciplinary vision. Why? Because the relationship between, between law and nature comes into these decisions. Those important decisions that we talk about in many universities in the world, like Atrato River decision, like the Amazon River decision, rulings, right? So we are, we're talking about nature. Those are rulings that keep in mind participation of communities that have been affected by these types of conflicts that must be solved by judges. In that sense, we can talk about uh, these dialogical rulings that we are having in our country. Why? Because following up these rulings, rulings and their compliance, we are keeping in mind communities that have been affected. What do they want? What their expectations are? What are their visions about uh, surrounding the territory? And this implies, of course, that these sentences sometimes imply re rejection, a lot of questions, but we could say that we are about to change uh, law because this is social construction and it means that it will change little by little and we're thinking about new tools to guarantee rights especially rights to territory those rights that are related to natural resources those rights that are related to very complex situations before many regulations that we have the problem is that here we need to have guarantees, judicial guarantees that we see from, from these rulings that are being passed. So there is inefficiency in territorial guarantee of rights and environmental guarantee of rights. So new elements are being built by judges and those elements are not in our constitution. They are just jurisprudence. So that's why it's so important to keep them in mind rights of nature, they allow overcoming the anthropocentric view that we have of nature and keep in mind that we are an element, an additional element to nature. And we need to have that harmonic relationship. To end, I would like to point out that new paradigms that we have with all these topics imply rethinking what we have done, rethinking about law, rethinking about human beings with nature, the environment, rethinking from this view that implies that we have interdependence, keeping in, in mind interdependence between human and non-human subjects, because we have this new social construction of policy and right and we are building new elements that allow going forward in building a peace, a Colombia in peace. Thank you very much. Van Vargas Roncancio. Well, thank you so very much for the invitation. And it's such a great privilege to be part of this conversation. Um, it's, it's also uh, very important um, for us in these times of transitions in our country. So I'm really glad to be part of this. Thank you to the organizers, uh, Miguel 
and uh, all of you who are uh, able to, to, to be present with us today. And thank you to Professor Gloria Amparo Rodriguez for her wonderful introduction and conversation around uh, the territorial rights and the rights of nature in our context. So I'm gonna go and, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, my work, um, which is uh, ethnographic in nature. I'm just gonna share the presentation and just take it away. So I hope, I hope you are able to see the presentation now, is that? We is that are, fair? yes, we are seeing it. Okay, so the, the, the title of the presentation is The Forest Ghost to, to a Court of uh, Law, Rights of Nature, Indigenous Legal Traditions, and Comparison in the Colombian Amazon. So this is just an outline of the presentation. I will start by uh, talking about this hypothesis of, of thinking about law as something that is not, also, not only about culture, but also uh, in light of the new developments such as the rights of nature, something that goes beyond the human and what this might look like in ethnographic encounters in Amazonia. The second part is gonna be uh, a, a, a directly about the rights of nature, I have some questions, conceptual tools to think about this idea, potential, potential theoretical challenges that this idea poses, and I will propose a comparative praxis that might include indigenous legal traditions as we think about the rights of nature uh, beyond um, the idea of granting rights to a known person, for example. So in 2019, I had the opportunity to join an ethnobotanical research project led by Colombian biologist David Rodriguez Mora, who is here with us today. The purpose of the project was to study the diversity and classification of several wild species of medicinal plants among the Cofan people of southwestern Colombia. This is how David, my friend and research interlocutor, describes his project and engagement with the research field. Quote, it was very exciting for me to contemplate the possibility to carry out a project that would contribute to the recovery of the most sacred plants of the Kofan, root of their cultural identity and their ancestral territory. But at the same time, I knew this was a huge responsibility, not only with the community of the Kofan nation, but also with the plants themselves. I had heard numerous, numerous accounts that described the power of the plant's spirits, he said. Additionally, I was aware that my training as an ethnobotanist and certainly, had certainly not prepared me to know how to deal with them, with these plants. Nevertheless, I felt reassured with the fact that this potential work was coming from the initiative of the Cofan authorities themselves and included the participation and endorsement of one of the most respected shamans in the country." End of quote. David's work was framed as a way to contribute to the protection of the root of the Kofan territory and shamanic medicine. In my friends, an important stepping stone in designing sustainable harvesting methods and dealing with the rapidly declining wild populations of these plants, while ensuring the continuation of Kofan shamanic medicine. While the purpose of his project was clear and increasingly aligned with the desires and expectations of the local community itself, they awaited co-creation of a scientific and legal protocol to guide the project was not without surprising and enriching equivocations. Drawing upon Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viveiros de Castro, an equivocation is not only a failure to understand, but a failure to understand that understandings are necessarily not the same and that they are not related to imaginary ways of seeing the world, but to real worlds that are being seen. For example, during one of the numerous meetings with the community that year, an indigenous practitioner and plants trainee considered that since the territory, quote, pro protects itself, there is no need to do a project for that to happen, end of quote. Interestingly, however, David's understanding of protecting the territory via the scientific study of the viability and conservation status of certain wild ritual plants was based upon our initial shared assumption that protecting the territory was a human endeavor and that the territory was the stage of this human behavior. On the contrary, for a local indigenous trainee, any protecting should count with the territory itself, not as the backdrop of human action, but as an active shaping force 
In a way, the territory and the human seem to be in continuity or co-constitutive relation with one another. This reaction to the research proposal and David's diplomatic skills responding to it stimulated um, a series of productive disagreements that eventually led to the co-creation of a research protocol which conjured the will of the plant and the invisible peoples of the mountain themselves as the people from southern Colombia uh, talk about their spirits. It was apparent to us that establishing a research agreement with the community would require more than just the meeting of human wills in rational deliberation. More than objects of research, territory, plants, and invisible peoples themselves appear as their active shaping forces from the get-go. At the end of the meeting, it was clear that conducting the project was not simply a matter of studying the classification of plants, but about learning with the plants, and certainly not only a matter of protecting territories and shamanic legacies, but also about learning an entirely different way of engaging with place. And finally, that any negotiation and eventual agreement with the community would require calling respectful and humble attention both to the will of the community with the internal deliberation procedures, as well as the will of the other than human beings in what my friend David would later conceptualize as the will of the mountain. If the territory could in fact protect itself, we needed to learn whether it was actually feasible for us to conduct research with a set of epistemological, ontological and value operations informing our thinking and action in the world on a daily basis. In his response to the interpolation, David highlighted the minimal needs of conservation of the vine as a way to protect the legacy of the Kofan people and also insisted on how important it was to involve all the human members of the community in the design of this participatory endeavor. To be sure, studying the conservation status of ritual plans would, for him, contribute to the protection of the territory and culture of the community as a whole. How can we care for a territory that seems to protect itself according to the indigenous trainee that I was referring to earlier? For a territory that seems to govern itself how does a place, a plant make place? And, and how can we participate or not in the modes of regulation that emerge from a willful place? After the meeting, we learned that words such as community, research, territory, agreement, planned, and research protocol would be subject to relentless negotiations and mutual ontological equivocations from the beginning. Just wanted to check in if you're hearing me okay. In an intervention entitled The Jower and the Telepathy of Jahe, former Humboldt, Humboldt Institute Director Brigitte, Brigitte Baptiste suggested something very similar when referring to the will of the other in the co-creation of protocols and norms. Recalling a research experience with an Amazonian community, she said, quote, we signed an agreement with the community, but for this agreement to enter into force, we needed trust. There were good reasons to demand that this contract between the Institute and the community should go beyond the norm written on a piece of paper. The cultural contract then required the intake of the plant, end of quote. The participation of other and human wills in the making of normative claims seems to summarize the stakes David's ethnobotanical research with the Kofan was referring to. Furthermore, during a conversation with uh, the oil sector about post-COVID scenarios in Colombia, renowned environmental scholar and activist Gustavo Wilches followed suit as he highlighted the agentive capacities of non-human others and the limits of human agency via, envir via environmental protections and rights alone. Quote, the pandemic expresses a call of the earth. The first letter was given with what today is recognized as climate crisis. And this is not only a business just between humans, he said. We, needed to learn, we need to learn how to come to terms with other actors of the territory that are not only resources. These actors are soils, hydro, hydrometeorological dynamics, volcanoes, and ecosystems. One of the big challenges that then is to learn how to consult with those ecosystems to avoid forcing them to claim their rights by force. And this is, I think, a very important task for today's um, uh, judges. Wilch's investigation also urged us to rethink rights 
responsibilities, agreements, and other uh, legal tools. What kind of law is then this law beyond the human? In fact, these similar claims, similar claims on the agentive capacities of non-humans by indigenous practitioners, policymakers, and sustainability researchers alike seem to share something in common, in my view, a normative kind, like kind of language. For example, David Dethnobotany said, quote, I knew this was a huge responsibility, not only with the community and the Kofan nation, but also with the plants themselves. In turn, Humboldt Institute Director B.G. Baptiste underscored how the cultural contract, quote, required the intake of the plant. While the indigenous trainee from the Kofan community insisted that we don't need a protocol for the territory takes care of itself. Finally, Wilshes, the Colombian environmental legal scholar, talked about, quote, coming to terms with other actors of the territory and consulting with those ecosystems. What is all this telling us? Uh, in my view, responsibilities, contracts, and consultations with territories and ecologies abound in current conversations around environmental governance in uh, Amazonia in particular, uh, especially today. And after what some have called the legal revolution of the rights of nature. Um, actually, we have a groundbreaking um, uh, ruling from the high court of our country uh, granting rights to the Amazon, which has had a different uh, points of view in terms of the feasibility of uh, um, undergoing this kind of implementation with today's legal paradigms. Are scientists, environmental scholars, and indigenous peoples asking for a new kind of contract that involves more than human agencies? What is agency and how is it formed in Southern Colombia? Does the language of the rise of nature suffice? So this is going to take us to the second portion of the presentation, where I will talk in some detail about the idea of the rise of nature and possible limits and, and um, um, possibilities of this idea. So the fol the, 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 what follows is based on a forthcoming chapter from uh, on uh, Miguel Hossein on a book edited by different colleagues uh, talking about this transition from a model of environmental law which is concentrates on, on, on command and control approaches to nature to an idea of ecological law that is based on, on indigenous legal traditions, uh, system thinking and other kinds of uh, tools. Um, and so I just um, want to, call, to call attention to this couple of questions as I uh, shared this with you. Recent norms and uh, judicial decisions on the rise of nature place life at the center of legal discourse in our country. This legal revolution thus purports to amend, upend the paradigm of solely human legal subjectivity in recognizing the personhood of nature, which poses an important challenge for judge, judges. Nevertheless, the rise of nature approach seems to depend on an assumption that the form of law is primarily linguistic and propositional. In this way, it reveals yet another critical assumption that law is a system of norms made by humans to regulate human conduct in relation to an externally existing natural, natural world, thereby insisting on the separation between law and life and indigenous traditions and life ways teaches this principle of interdependence, as well as different um, um, scientific approaches to consciousness. I argue that recognizing nature as a legal person and subject of rights falls short if law is understood as a matter of human language only and nature is understood as an inadequate conception of cosmological interdependencies between all that exist. The thesis of law as language seems to reinforce a much contested rift between mind and body, culture and nature, among other boundary making notions at the root of modern thought and practice. In what sense then, could conjuring other than human beings as agents of legal meaning rather than mere recipients of state sanctioned rights transform what we might call what we might mean by law and by the rights of nature in our country and Latin America at large. So I want to draw attention to this. How can we bridge the gap between imagination about the law uh, methodology? So how we do stuff, how we implement an adjudication in concrete scenarios when it comes to the rights of nature in this new dimension of law that we might call hesitantly, however, the ontological term um, and the decolonial orientation of that, that idea. How can we foster the legal activation of relationality? I'm drawing here from Colombian anthropologist Arturo Escobar. And that is the activation of relational thinking in concrete scenarios of adjudication. How can we get 
both dialogical judges, as Professor Amparo was telling, but also relational thinkers. So the vital indigenous principle of radical interdependence suggests that entities do not precede the relationships that comprise them. In fact, all existence, uh, whether minerals, animals, plants, humans, or rivers, co-emerge relationally. For example, in Amazonia, animal plants and mountains, among other beings, are endowed with a form of interiority or soul with attributes identical to those, human, to those of humans, such as reflexive consciousness, intentionality, affective life, and respect for ethical principles. In this region, the world is not intrinsically organized to the stable categories of nature and culture, since all beings, human and not, share a common interiority concealed underneath the mask of their own bodies. And there is a, a, a broad of, um, uh, of ethnographic support of this claim, both in Amazonia and elsewhere in Andean ethnographies as well. This theory of the self affords quite a different understanding of the law as something beyond cultural and human meaning. For indigenous communities in Colombia, for example, legal protocols come into being through ritual and everyday relations between animals, plants, spirits, and humans, mediated by the taita, often a traditional political authority, but also a medic uh, or the chairman. Applied in instances ranging from ritual procedures to research contracts and from prior, prior consultations between the state and local authorities to the allocation of justice in the community itself, legal meaning in, this, in these protocols is the emergent effect of interbeing engagements rather than the will of the human expressed through the vehicle of language. This legal cosmology, in my view, challenges a Western legal theory at, in at least two fronts. First, um, it expands the arc of subjectivity to include humans and more than human beings as ways of life or movement rather than single bodies with pre-designed limits. An ontological commitment to relation rather than substance has a special bearing in concrete scenarios of adjudication where legal redress requires politically contentious demarcations of social ecosystems, like a, a recent case about the Paramo, um, in, one Paramo in our country, one more, more in our country. Secondly, this relational principle exceeds or destabilizes the dualistic categories that structure legal thinking from the ground up in modern law. So how does a relational ontology transform our understanding and practice of the rights of nature beyond the recognition of a state granted rights to natural entities? What does it mean to grant rise to relationships instead of substances or persons? I claim first that although it promises to draw on these relational ontologies, the rise of nature does it in a limit way, limited way, taking as a legal language to shift the idea of actors, namely as a human only issue, the rise of nature approach seems to transpose the notion of the individual as a legal agent onto non-human fluid agencies without integrating their constitutive interdependencies. So we run rise to particular animals, to particular species, but the different um, elements that comprise their uh, beings are sometimes left out of the conversation. So uh, what I'm suggesting is that we need to pay closer attention to this interface between law and relations and interdependencies. Secondly, and perhaps more crucially, the rise of nature real politique, if you will, is far removed from the ontological commitment to the non-human as a value in itself. I just want to know how, how we're doing on time. I don't really want to go beyond the 20. You have uh, two and a half minutes. Okay, perfect. So I wanted to, um, I'll probably just go um, finalize, continue with this and then uh, go straight to the comparison. Um, so the rise of nature approach then faces several productive uh, challenges. In my view, one of them is what I'm calling the idea of a diffuse nature, the notion, of, the notion that nature is diffuse because this word might refer to humans and non-humans or the non-human beings only. The idea of a collision of cosmologies, the idea of the rise of, that the rise of nature extends personhood to a generic nature that is immediately equated, for example, to the Andean Pachamama uh, in the Andean context or the Quechua, for the Quechua speak, speaking people. However, this idea of Pachamama encompasses many things, including earth and time, the sun and the moon, the goddess of fertility, among others. Another challenge has to do with, this, with discreteness. So that the idea that nature is composed of millions of species and each aspect of nature involves a different social legal interest. So as a result, it is impossible to articulate legal claims for each component of nature, 
which uh, means that a democracy of rights based on discrete beings is impractical, impracticable um, or, or very challenging and might lead to an identity politics for nature with challenges similar to those already faced by human groups. And finally, this idea of human mediation, if we are to, thought, to think about the law as something that is not only about humans, but also about other relations, then this idea of human mediation is, is central. The self-standing of humans, as it were, is impossible within a legal system based on an idea of law as language only, or a conception of law as a human-only system of meaning. So uh, these challenges raises, raise uh, at least three crucial questions for legal, legal theory, and I think I'm going to leave it there. Uh, what should be considered as existing for concrete scenarios of adjudication? What kind of people should act on whose behalf? And what is the procedure for adjudicating rights in context of pervasive, pervasive extractivism and war like our country? The preceding assessment calls for a radical transformation of the rights of nature. I hope I have more time to explain uh, a way forward. I'll, I'll be happy to discuss this in, in the Q&A. But let me just end by saying that uh, although the rights of nature poses several ethical, theoretical, um, and, um, uh, and practical challenges, it's, it's such an important idea uh, in the words of, of Boyd. It's, 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 uh, it's starting a revolution. It's starting a conversation at the heart of law and lawmaking. But we need to understand that the, the rights of nature also poses a question to the idea of law itself and how law is organized both theoretically and in practice. Because if we were, if we were gonna take the rights of nature seriously, in my view, it means uh, serious engagement with how different traditions, indigenous traditions, for example, might think about relationships and how they emerge and how they become law for them. So I think uh, this conversation is very productive. And I think uh, we are in the verge of uh, deeply interesting and transformative um, um, elements as, as we uh, help our judges to, uh, to grasp these different traditions and provide uh, uh, rulings that are attuned both in terms of language and, and the practical outcomes to indigenous ways of thinking about life and the law. Thank you so very much for, for um, listening and I'll be happy to, to go to the Q&A. So thank you very much, Miguel Rojas. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much, Miguel uh, Londono for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be part of this event and also of working with uh, Gloria Miguel the Environment, the Law Institute and others in promoting the effective enforcement of Colombian laws in relation to the protection of forests. My presentation will focus on the rule of law in a very specific way in dealing with access to justice and participatory rights in environmental matters. And it is with great interest that we from the European perspective has followed, have followed the developments in Latin America and the Caribbean during the negotiation of the Esquisu Agreement, which we perceive as a sister treaty to the Aarhus Convention. The Aarhus Convention has been active for about 20 years, and I have been the chair of the Compliance Committee to this convention for 10 years now, almost, almost 10 years. So, what I would like to, to describe for you is how the Aarhus Convention and also the Eskasu Agreement, when it gets into force, how it promotes the rule of law and it addresses key issues relating to access to information, public participation in decision making, access to justice, fundamental notions of no harassment, persecution or penalization, principles of non-discrimination, and also by setting up a specific kind of non-judicial or quasi-judicial review mechanism. But before doing so, I would like to just take you one step back and to consider the rationale of these developments, which is very closely linked to human rights notion. Why promote access to justice and participatory rights? And I have listed here a couple of elements that we can find in policy documents, in preambles of these instruments, and in jurisprudence and literature. The promote on, of the respect for rules generally and the implementation of environmental laws. Even though we have public authorities to implement it, public authorities cannot do it uh, entirely. Public authorities cannot represent 
all interests in all respects. It improves the quality of environmental decision making to allow members of the public to voice their issues, which are very often quite diverse. It improves the control and transparency of the public administration and thus it can prevent corruption. For sure, it is linked to the protection of human rights. It may enhance the legitimacy, fairness and justice in decision making and more generally the trust in public authorities and thus promote environmental democracy and the rule of law. And in this respect, also, of course, improve the implementation of environmental laws in these respects that were described by Gloria and Ivan in the previous presentations about the protection and even the legal recognition and personality of natural objects, if that is part of the judicial system. So in Europe, in addition to the Oris Convention, which is the most advanced treaty on the rule of law in environmental matters, the European Convention on Human Rights, which is 70 years old and which doesn't even mention the word environment, which no treaty did from that time, has developed, much inspired by the Oris Convention, into a treaty that also uh, considers human rights aspects in relation to the environment. There is an impressive and robust jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, where it also cites in some cases, the Aarhus Convention and the Rio Declaration of 1992. But the, the Aarhus Convention itself that I will be focusing on, but I think it's important to link it to existing human rights regimes. And as I will show you in a while, you have the same situation or a similar situation in Latin America and the Caribbean. In addition, of course, for huge parts of Europe, the European Union legal system can add to the, the promotion of the rule of law in environmental matters. So, the first element of the Aarhus Convention, and I will give you a short description so that you are familiar with this. And in many ways, the Eskisu Agreement is structured in a similar way. So the Aarhus Convention sets out the right for members of the public to have access to environmental information held by the public authorities. And that should be provided as soon as possible. There are grounds for refusing the, um, access, they are limited and they are set out and it's only on the basis of these grounds that a request can be denied. In parallel to the obligation to provide information upon request, public authorities are obliged to gather and possess and update environmental information. Without that obligation, the right to access environmental information may be quite, uh, if not useless, at least uh, it doesn't have the same potential. So it is this combination of providing access and also of continuously gathering and updating, which is the, the uh, important part. The second pillar is about public participation. And the convention sets minimum requirements on how members of the public can engage in decision-making with respect to specific activities, with respect to plans, city plans, spatial plans of different sorts, and also programs and policies, and even about generally applicable legally binding instruments. One of the key concepts is that members of the public must be engaged at an early stage when early and effective participation can take place. That means when, when there is no decision made yet, so that the members of the public can present their views and their comments, and these views and comments must be taken into account. Of course, it does not amount to a veto of members of the public because quite often members of the public have completely contrary views to each other. So the point is that all these views has to be taken into account on legal and practical matters. The third part is about access to justice. If I'm denied access to the information that I have requested, I should be allowed and able to uh, have a review of that decision in court or a court-like body. Members of the public should have access to a review procedure also with respect to decisions, acts and omissions regarding a specific activity and also access to justice in relation to any act and omission by a public authority or member of the public which contravene national law relating to the environment. This is a very important element because it actually opens up for almost all, not only almost, but all environmental decision making relating to national environmental law. The convention also 
sets out that these remedies should be effective, fair, equitable, and that the procedures must not be prohibitively expensive. It's very important. It's like it, the courts should not be like the Ritz Hotel, open for everyone as long as they can pay. It must be also open in real life. In addition to these pillars, the convention sets out that members of the public must not be harassed, persecuted, or penalized when exercising, exercising the convention rights. And as I will mention in a little while, we have actually had a very important case on this specific issue. Also, environmental issues, no, no border. It doesn't bother about passport control. Nuisance crosses state borders and members of the public in a neighboring country can be just as uh, badly affected as people living in the state of the activity. So the Oris Convention sets out that when implementing and applying the Convention, members of the public shall be ensured the same rights without discrimination as to citizenship, nationality or domicile, registered state or effective center of activities. This is also a very important point, again, knowing the spatial scope and the scale of many environmental issues. So, now this brings me to where my almost daily life working in the Oris Convention Compliance Committee. The, Oris, the Compliance Committee is not a court, and it's very clear to set that out immediately. Yet it is a committee with some quasi-judicial elements. And I think these elements are very important for the trustworthiness and for the integrity of the committee. These, this committee, as opposed to many other compliance committees under other treaties, is completely independent. We are not representing governments, the committee members, we are nine members. The procedure is non-confrontational, non-judicial and of consultative nature, but we apply very important elements of due process. The compliance committee receives communications from members of the public and also from some parties, but we have received so far about 180 communications. So we have registered 180 cases. We have completed quite a number of them where the committee reviews whether a party complies or doesn't comply with the requirements sets out in the convention. For those parties who found non-compliant, we report to the meeting of the parties, which makes a decision on the basis of which the compliance committee continued to follow what happens in that party, in that state, until it has done its homework until it has changed its legislation, its jurisprudence and practice, so as to meet the convention rights. The committee provides findings and also recommendations on what the parties could do to get into the compliance. Some states fear the compliance committee because they are afraid they may even think that it is a court that will keep them uh, legally responsible. I would say it's the other way around and states should be comfortable with the compliance mechanism and also civil society should do so. It provides a transparent and independent means of examining compliance. It, we give advice and we assist parties when they are in non-compliance. Parties sometimes request the committee to make specific uh, advice on how they can get into compliance and how they should apply certain laws in order to ensure compliance. During the years of the committee's existence, we have developed very good dialogues with observers, with members of the public, but also with governments. It doesn't mean that governments are always happy, of course, with our findings, but I can tell you that civil society is also not always happy with our findings because the committee is independent. It doesn't lean on either side. This is fundamental. This, the Compliance Committee is not a dispute settlement body. It is rather a means of avoiding disputes in the future. So this brings me now to Latin America for my last minutes, where you are now at the stage of creating a similar regime. You, in, in Latin America and Caribbean too, not only is the Esquesu agreement getting, into, uh, getting in force, there is also, since 1969, a legal framework on human rights. And the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has also developed into an instrument uh, which is very important for the protection of the environment. And as you are aware, the advisory opinion of the Inter-American Court on Human Rights to the Compliance Committee, to, sorry, to Colombia a few years ago, also very explicitly linked the Inter-American Convention to 
participatory rights in the sense that I just explained. The SKSU agreement follows a very similar structure to the Oris Convention. They are not identical. In some respects, the SKSU agreement goes a bit further than the Oris Convention. In other, it's vaguer and not as strict as the Oris Convention. But here too, minimum requirement on access to information, on public participation in decision making, on access to justice. I will come back to the next part about protection of human rights, also provisions about no discrimination. This provision about human rights defenders in environmental matters is, I think, a very important, it's for, for the region in Latin America and the Caribbean. The provision for the Oris Convention set out that members of the public must not be harassed, persecuted and penalized when enjoying or exercising convention rights. We had a case where members of the public from Belarus some years ago complained to the Compliance Committee about being uh, arrested, persecuted, um, because they're an exercise of convention rights. And the Compliance Committee concluded that Belarus failed to comply with the Oris Convention in that respect. Now the Compliance Committee is following up in a dialogue with the Belarus government on what it does, what it doesn't do sufficiently in order to get in compliance with the convention. Given the history in Latin America, not least in Colombia, with the problem of harassment, persecution, and even killing of human rights defenders and of environmental defenders, of course, this could be a very important instrument in combination with others to promote the respect of human rights defenders and the protection of human rights defenders in environmental matters. So I think the, in this way, if this provision, in combination with the other com convention uh, standards are complied with, this would be very important for environmental peace building, not only in Colombia, but maybe particularly in Colombia in the future. So I think from no segment of society, neither industry, government, landowners or others, should they fear the entry into force of the SKSU agreement and also the establishment of a compliance mechanism in the way that we have developed for Europe and for Central Asia. So I'm coming to the conclusion, I see my time is, uh, I'm running out of time. A couple of issues that I want to, to uh, highlight here. Again, both the Oros Convention and the SKSU Agreement draw on established human rights notions. They develop human rights thinking to environmental matters by also opening up for environmental organizations to be active, to participate in decision making, to request information, and also to request legal review of cases. This is a very learning exercise we have had to see the value. It's important for the compliance committee when we examine compliance, not only to have the voice of the government, but also from others to find out what is the correct um, understanding of the situation in a given party. The convention sets minimum standards. They do not prevent parties from going further in protecting the environment, rather the contrary, they promote that and the SKSU agreement also include the provision of no step back or no rolling back. So the parties should not reduce the participatory rights in the future. It promotes civil society engagement. It promotes dialogue, the respect of the rule of law. I'm not saying that this is always simple. I'm not naive. I know that conflicts will be there, but it provides a way of dealing with it which is um, more peaceful, which is more open and, and transparent, I think, than many other experiences. And thus it enhances the legitimacy and the fairness and also trust in environmental governments more broadly. Again, there's a few words about the international compliance control that you will be developing also. This is something that governments should also appreciate. It is not a vector some play where when some gets more rights, someone lose rights. It is a way of jointly improving the protection of the environment or of promoting the protection and the rights on public participation and access to justice. And also again, to repeat the protection
section of members of the public who defend human rights and who defend uh, the environment in these um, different cases. I think I stop there, so we will have some time for uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jonas. And uh, please keep yourself with your uh, screen open. And we call uh, Ivan Vargas and Professor Gloria Amparo Rodriguez uh, to the table. Uh, I think many very important uh, um, issues are running uh, around here. And I will, uh, we already have uh, a couple of uh, questions, but let me uh, start with a question and is uh, to try to tie your uh, three presentations um, together. Um, Jonas was talking about environmental democracy, right? And how environmental democracy uh, can be achieved through this framework, law framework, uh, international uh, frameworks of law. Uh, Colombia is moving towards uh, uh, accepting being part of the Escazú agreement. Uh, it has, you know, a certain um, number of steps to, to get there. Uh, and here we have this idea of democracy, and uh, Jonas was saying it clearly, an issue connected with a tradition of human rights, human rights, in which this issue of environmental rights is, is just starting to starting to break ground. Then we say is a framework that is, let's say, international, top to bottom, countries agree to become part of this democratic um, space. Uh, uh, but if we are talking about environmental democracy, then we have uh, Professor Rodriguez and, 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 and Ivan Vargas uh, talking about uh, epistemological transition, an ontological turn uh, in which nature become a subject of rights. And then the human dimension and uh, being part of a larger right, framework. Uh, then the idea is how we can, uh, and, and I think uh, Professor Gloria was telling us these wonderful experiences of dialogical uh, justice or justice working in dialogical ways, right? In which uh, representatives of the framework of law go to the territories, to the spaces in which conflicts are happening to mediate with the peoples and the institutions. Uh, but at the same time, and, and, and Ivan was uh, posing it, the territory speaks through its non-human forces. And in a multidisciplinary or transversal way, we have to start listening to that while this ontological turn uh, happens. Then we have a very interesting scenario, uh, and Colombia can become a really important player on rethinking these frameworks uh, while they are going from top and coming from the bottom. Uh, then here we have three uh, uh, people that are working on these connections. How do you find ways to create this communication, fluid communication between these two frameworks and this very interesting, challenging ontological turn? For any of you. Entendiste la pregunta, Gloria Faro? Okay. Okay, yeah. well, just to expand a little bit since you linked it into my presentation, what I meant by environmental democracy here, it is not in any way to replace it from representative democracy or voting rights, but it is to combine and to allow for members of the public to express their concern, to be part of decision making that concerns their living environment, their surrounding, their, their relation with nature, their relation with others. It is a way of promoting their freedom of expression and the sense of citizenship and of being part of society. I think the, the points made by Gloria about, you translated it to dialogical justice, and I think it means justice through dialogue. Yeah, no, I think it, is, it very much fits into the um, rationale and the objective of the Oral Convention too. Because in decision-making, as I said, members of the public have different views. 
and the point is to have them being shared and then on the basis of their views and applicable law, a decision will be provided. So I think this, if you listen to Ivan's theoretical presentation, to me, an important theorist in terms of environmental democracy is the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas, who speaks of the importance of citizenship and of being recognized as someone who be, is part of these kind of decisions. So I think I stopped there, but I think it linked very well into the notion of dialogical justice, as was mentioned. Great. Anyone else wants to extend oh. that? Por favor, go ahead, Paro. Sí, yo lo, lo, lo concibo de, de, de varias maneras. Yo creo que hay como unos estándares o unas escalas, ¿sí? Esas escalas empiezan eh, eh, simplemente por la información, la información que está de primera mano. Nadie conoce más el territorio que la gente que lo habita. Y muchas veces nosotros tenemos la dificultad de que tomamos decisiones sobre un territorio casi sin conocerlo. Entonces, aquí hay, hay un, una, una primer, un primer elemento muy importante a tener en cuenta la información, pero no solamente la información que nosotros tenemos del orden científico, de las universidades, de las instituciones, sino también de las comunidades. Y aquí debe darse ese diálogo importante, un diálogo que permita la concertación. Por ejemplo, la concertación en medidas que nos permitan adoptar decisiones para compensar las afectaciones que deben realizarse pero además que tengan en cuenta esos elementos culturales, económicos de las comunidades. El tema de la fiscalización es importante. Colombia tiene en ese momento una dificultad muy grande en el, el tema de manejo de recursos ¿sí? eh, y eh, de corrupción. Aquí necesitamos también gente eh, que esté dentro de ese marco en un tercer nivel fiscalizando. ¿Para qué? Para poder llegar a proponer eh, a su... Eh, poner eh, 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 soluciones a los problemas que se eh, involucran, concertar esas decisiones y poder adoptar decisiones que nos permitan que todos hagamos parte. ¿sí? El diálogo es fundamental, por eso la propuesta tiene que ser dialógica. Vamos a hablar con todos los sectores, a escuchar a todos los sectores, las expectativas y en ese sentido tener en cuenta esos diversos niveles de la participación y de la incidencia implica tener en cuenta otras lenguas, tener en cuenta otras formas de ver el mundo, tener en cuenta otras necesidades de las comunidades desde el interior de las comunidades. Creo que por ahí eh, lo pensaría yo. Thank you very much. And we have a question directed precisely to uh, this issue. Uh, this is to Juan Vargas and Gloria Amparo. And the question is by Ana and says, rights of nature and neoliberal multiculturalism. The Amazon subject of rights ruling has been criticized by Opiak, for example. Two issues are in here. First, what happens to peasants? The peasant question in Colombia is pressing. Second, what happens to multinatural nature in a multiculturalist regime of law? The Constitution of 1991, the Resguardos, Essentialist Ethnicization, etc. So um, I think this is a very important question. And um, let me just start by saying that we have here different levels of the debate. One concerns um, what we might frame as the legal imagination. So how different sectors of society imagine law to be and what it can do, what it can do in society. The second has to do with legal education. It has to do with how we can teach these new ideas and start creating the changes and, um, and possibilities for, for these new ideas to, to be um, part of the political conversation in our country. And the other has to do with the level of, of, of compliance and adjudication, this level of applying these new rules. And I think that, that there is uh, certainly a gap between all these different levels. So uh, uh, usually, I mean, in, in universities, there is a tendency, and, I, and I, this is a point of self-criticism, uh, perhaps to um, um, put an emphasis on, on imagination, to put an emphasis on how we can engage with these ideas in a way that it's both useful and appealing, but sometimes um, we, we fall in the more appealing, um, um, you know, tendency, um, which is, I think, important, but yet it has limits. The rights of nature is such an important idea and contribution from the legal theory standpoint 
but it's such a difficult thing to apply in a society that is constructed around anthropocentric values and practices. So I will say that, for instance, to now address the question, um, so there is a lot of criticism for, for of, about different different ways of enforcing these rights on the ground, and I think one I, I agree with the, with the, with the premise of the question. One of the issues is that uh, there is this tension between nature and ethnic groups, indigenous groups, and peasants. And peasants in Colombia, in particular, uh, don't don't have this the, the kind of ethnic the kind of a collective legal identity that other groups have in our country. So it's very difficult to put in conversation these two things. So it's, it's, a, it's a fair point of critique, but I think that the idea is opening space for debate and deliberation, as Jonas was saying, citing Habermas. So the other important point has to do with, with how rights of nature or any right for that matter couldn't be something uh, that, we, that, that we need to be attentive to what happened in the ground. So rights are taken up differently in different places. So for some people, the rights of nature might be very challenging to apply because the administrative uh, um, um, engineer, the administrative uh, 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 space is not amenable to this idea. I might require huge investments of money and resources that local communities might not have or local government levels. So this is a, there is a bureaucracy challenge as well for this. And I mean, I, I just wa I want to leave it there, but uh, um, I think uh, I want to just go back to these three levels of, of thinking about these ideas and the limits and possibilities that it might offer for, for thinking and for, for, for adjudication. Yeah, and actually we have a really interesting examples going on in Latin America. For example, the Brazilian movement uh, Semterra has been in alliance with now with indigenous uh, communities uh, fighting for issues of land tenure and uh, uh, operations within uh, the space of of uh, agribusinesses and uh, indigenous uh, resguardos. In Colombia too, the recently we have a, a big mobilization of peasant uh, uh, leaders and at the end they started to uh, uh, start conversations uh, with uh, the indigenous uh, uh, movement with ONIC and there are common fronts but also there are disagreements. We have uh, three more questions. I'm going to read them uh, 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 through because we are uh, getting uh, to the end of the of the webinar. Uh, this is uh, from Anonymous. In Colombia's post-conflict reconstruction is there a push to exploit Colombia's natural resources? If so, do you believe territorial rights help combat extractive industries for, for taking advantage of Colombians' rebuilding process? Uh, another uh, question uh, says, uh, by, this is by Estefania Cortez. Gracias, Estefania. The judicial legitimacy to demand environmental rights is inherent from the sense of citizenship. Therefore, anyone can be involved, or is it mainly directed to people that live in that territory, indigenous peoples? And uh, another one in Spanish, I'm gonna to try to translate it uh, right away. In my work uh, as an ethnobotanist, I believe this is uh, from uh, David, Una de las iniciativas, one of the initiatives that uh, has more interest and urgency uh, in uh, the life of the COFAN, the indigenous uh, uh, people, uh, and other groups of indigenous people is to link uh, traditional medicine, indigenous traditional medicine, to the uh, 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 health system uh, in Colombia. I ask myself, how do we uh, get uh, as such an objective uh, from uh, the framework framework of law uh, in Colombia. There are open for the three of you, uh, and this will be the last questions we take. Anyone about uh, post-conflict reconstruction, sí. reconstruction Listo. and natural Inicio, inicio yo para que hablemos de los temas de los derechos territoriales. El tema de los de derechos territoriales implican eh, incluso protección del territorio. Y voy a darles el ejemplo. Una comunidad en Colombia estaba afectada por múltiples proyectos, eh, proyectos mineros que querían realizarse allí, un área de, una gran, de un gran valor ambiental. ¿Por qué razón? Porque tenía, tiene eh, condiciones ecológicas de muchísima riqueza, muchísima riqueza, por ejemplo, en recursos genéticos, en especies endémicas, pero además porque allí vive una comunidad 
con una tradición muy fuerte de protección ambiental. La única manera que esta comunidad tuvo para poder proteger el, el territorio tenía que ver con derechos eh, de garantías territoriales, pero además con la declaración como parque nacional. La figura de parque nacional fue la única que le permitió el que no se hicieran proyectos mineros en su territorio. Entonces, en este sentido, los derechos territoriales pueden contribuir. ¿Y ¿En qué manera? En la, en la medida en que esos derechos territoriales implican que deben cumplirse elementos importantísimos como tener en cuenta los aspectos eh, eh, culturales, eh, el tema de la consulta previa que es fundamental, el tema del consentimiento previo libre e informado que creo que, que es fundamental. Con sobre, en segundo lugar, la persona que preguntaba sobre si cualquier persona, claro, estamos en defensa de lo público. En defensa de lo público eso significa que el territorio debe ser defendido por todos. En especial nosotros los que trabajamos en temas ambientales entendemos que proteger un área como la Amazonía, no obstante la distancia donde yo estoy de la Amazonía que es muy grande, protegerla también significa defender lo público, defenderlo de todos y poder proteger el ambiente. El tema de lo que sucede allí también me afecta a mí de alguna, de alguna forma. Así yo esté en la ciudad, puedo defender los derechos territoriales de diferente, de diferente manera. En ese sentido es fundamental. Creo que, por ejemplo, lo que se ha dado con la decisión de la sentencia del atrato, que se promovió que las personas que viven en la zona sean los guardianes de esa... De esa, de esa, de esa de esa región, implica hacer un ejercicio muy importante. Eh, por ejemplo, ellos han acudido a universidades lejanas para poder aportar elementos para soluciones técnicas. ¿sí? Ellos tienen sus saberes, sus propios conocimientos, pero también hay momentos en que nosotros requerimos de sus conocimientos o ellos de los nuestros. Aquí hay un trabajo fundamental para, para, para hacerse en esta materia. Gracias. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Jonas? Jonas, you want to say something? Uh, may I? Please. Okay, so um, I will respond or not at least reflect on the question posed by Stefania, was it? Um, and of course not, I don't have the detail of Colombia law, but I can give you an example from how the Aarhus Convention has been applied. The Aarhus Convention doesn't use the term citizen. The Escazú Agreement does, but the Oros Convention, it speaks about members of the public. And it is fundamental, and I think this can be developed also in the regime of the Escazú Agreement. It's important that members of the public, not only in the specific territory where an activity takes place, but also outside, should be able to, to uh, give their views if they are concerned. To give you one example, I won't have much time, but we had a complaint from members of the public in Germany that the United Kingdom had not informed them about the decision making concerning a new nuclear power plant in the United Kingdom. Therefore, the German citizen complained they were not able to participate in the decision making in the UK, even though they were concerned that if there was uh, um, an incident, they would be affected. I mean, we know from history in Europe with the Chernobyl case that radiation knows no border. And the Compliance Committee found that the United Kingdom had failed to comply with the Convention because it had not notified members of the public in Germany about the decision-making process so that they could go there. This is just an illustration of how far-reaching um, these rules are. I think that it is important also in the SKSU context that, of course, the interests of those who are most affected locally, if we speak about mining or deforestation, should be there. But if you have other situation, you must also not exclude those who can be severely affected, even though they don't live near the industry. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jonas. Uh, and there are so mm. many other things. Falta uh, una pregunta. Okay, do uh, you want know to briefly, Ivan? Do you yeah. want to yes. answer that, please? Yeah, just, uh, um, just to answer briefly the question about, um, about resource extraction in times of post-conflict. Um, I think has to do, I think the key issue here has to do with conceptions of territoriality and the territory. So we, if we think of the territory of, as, as, as something that where we can go and extract things out from, um, that, that is, that's one idea, which is part of the development idea of, of, of 
how we engage with the territory. But we think of territory as sentient, as indigenous people think about the territory. Our relationship would be one between people. So I think our, I mean, we are not yet in that point because we have not heard enough indigenous communities that think and know, as, as Professor Amparo was saying, know their territories. And, and we need to integrate that knowledge. We, not, we need to be able to integrate that knowledge into legal language. And uh, I think the kind of, of, of transition that we are facing in our country has to put in, in, in the center both the, the, the voice of victims, but also the voice of the territory as a victim of violence. And that, in, and that necessitates a different idea of what a territory is and how it, it is differently in different places. So I just wanna leave it there. And, um, and I think that. that idea, and uh, Gloria, uh, do you wanna, querías uh, comentar también? Sí. Muy corto es simplemente para la persona que preguntó sobre el trabajo con los cofanes y cómo hacer el tema de la medicina tradicional con la nuestra. Realizamos un trabajo con el profesor Germán Zuluaga eh, sobre lo que son los conocimientos tradicionales eh, y el enlace entre medicina tradicional y, la, y nuestra medicina. Ese trabajo está publicado y lo pueden bajar de mi blog, en el blog que está, para que lo tengan a la, a la mano. Okay, we'll be sharing that information. Thank you, uh, you all very much uh, for such an uh, impressive and incredible amount of information. I think the Colombian case is a cornerstone to rethink our relation with nature uh, in a moment of the Anthropocene, uh, in the larger discussions about how we can uh, uh, face uh, uh, climate change and global climate and global change in general. Uh, we really appreciate your time and thank you all for being here. We want to invite you uh, to our uh, following uh, webinar in the series that connects really well with uh, what uh, the three of you were saying. Uh, the voices from Defensores del Medio Ambiente, Environmental Defenders, uh, our next webinar, October 29, 2020, 10 a.m. Eastern time, uh, when we will be hearing from environmental defenders from the field in Colombia. We have confirmed Ubencel Duque Rojas, Presidente de la Asociación de Paz del Magdalena Medio, uh, speaking from Barranca Bermeja, Santander. Amado Villafaña, an indigenous uh, mamo from the Arahuaco people, environmental defender of Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, and the most important environmental filmmaker uh, in Latin America uh, from a disclosed location near Nabucimaque, the capital of the Aruacos in Cesar. Nabucimaque. And, and we are waiting for confirmation from Francia Marquez Mina, the Goldman Environmental Awardee in 2018, and now a presidential candidate for uh, the movement Pueblo en Movimiento, uh, speaking from Suarez Cauca. We are still agending her, her time. Thank you all for your participation. On behalf of Duke University Center for International and Global Studies, the Environmental Peace Building Association, the Global Green Growth Institute, uh, Duke University in Kunshan, China, China. Greetings. Muchas gracias. We'll see you soon. Muchísimas gracias.